The Tech 3 strategic cruisers are, in my opinion at least, some of the coolest ships in EVE Online, whereas most vessels out there have a fixed slot layout and a set of skill bonuses that dictate what that hull should do, the Tech 3 strategic cruisers are different. They have four subsystems, and each of those subsystems has three different options. These subsystems allow you to choose what kind of skill bonuses you want your ship to have, and its very slot layout, allowing you to pretty much customise the ship to precisely what you want to do with it. Now this does mean that doing a definitive video on any one of these is nigh on impossible, but in today's video I want to sit down with you all and showcase why I love the Tengu and how you can fit it to run C3 combat sites. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi and I love the Tengu. Now this ship isn't as popular as it used to be. There was a point in time where the Tengu was absolutely pretty much everyone's ship that they were aiming for. It was the ship that could do anything, and naturally that meant it did get a fairly well-deserved nerf a couple of years ago. But in response to that, a lot of Tengu pilots extracted all of their Kaldari strategic skills and repurposed those two Minmatar cruisers in order to fly the now more popular Loki. The thing is, if you've already got a load of Kaldari points, I don't think the Tengu suddenly has any issues. I think that if you're the kind of person who wants to chase the meta, then you're gonna go for the biggest and best ship anyway. But to the same token, I think flying a ship that you love and enjoy is better than going for the 0.1% difference that you might get flying something else. I want to showcase today that the Tengu absolutely can do C3 wormhole ratting. I had a Tengu from a while ago when I was in Signal Cartel, I had never undocked it, I went looking for fits and looking for ideas, and every time I said to someone, I want to take this thing into a wormhole, I want to be able to scan down relic and data sites, I want to go into combat sites and be able to do those, people told me I was crazy, why would you do a Tengu for that? Just use a cheap cheater for the relic and data sites, and then the combat sites you're going to want something like a rat snake or at least a praxis. Then I tried the Tengu anyway, and it works. It works and it's a lot of fun, it makes good isk, it allows me to tick every single playstyle box that I enjoy in this game, so I'm going to show you how. First of all then, let's talk about the skills required for this one. Now, it's a Tengu, there are going to be a lot of different skills all over the place, and it's worth pointing out that the mastery section for the tier 3 cruisers is absolutely all over the place. Like, genuinely, you can be absolutely maxed in the thing you want your Tengu to do, and it won't even show up as Mastery 1, because this ship is so versatile, the mastery system wants you to basically tick boxes for all of the myriad different playstyles. So essentially, ignore the mastery for this ship in particular. Anyway, so let's have a look at the skills you're going to need to fly it first of all. That means we're going to need to go into Spaceship Command, and we're going to go down to the Kaldari skills, notably Kaldari Strategic Cruiser. And if we go show info on this one, you'll see there are some rather heavy prerequisites for this. Most notable, Kaldari Cruiser 5. Obviously for Kaldari Cruiser 5, you're going to need Kaldari Destroyer and Frigate both to 3 and Spaceship Command to 1, um, to 2, sorry. Then Kaldari Cruiser all the way up to 5, and that skill on its own is about 24-25 days worth of training, so this is something you are going to be basically dedicating yourself towards, but with the amount of variety and versatility that a T3C can pull off, I honestly think it's worth it. Obviously as well, not being a non-tech one ship, it's locked behind a Mega. You are going to need to have a Mega on your account in order to fly one of these. But it doesn't stop at having Kaldari Cruiser 5 and Kaldari Strategic Cruiser at 5. No, we need to have the subsystem skills as well. So if we go into the subsystems menu, we can see there's Kaldari Core, Defensive, Offensive, and Propulsion subsystems. And if you look at these skills, you'll see they don't do anything other than buff those particular subsystems. Now, of course, you're going to want to train all of these to 5 anyway. If you're dedicating yourself into a T3 Tactical, sorry, a T3 Strategic Cruiser, then you are going to want to max this out, and there's no reason not to anymore. Once upon a time, if you died whilst you were in a strategic cruiser, you lost a random level from one of your subsystems. So if you died in this Tengu, I might then wake up with offensive systems only at level 4 rather than level 5. That meant a lot of people only trained these to level 4. 
That got taken out of the game. That is not there anymore. You can die in a Tengu as many times as you like and you will never lose your skills for it. That is an awesome change and it means there's even less reason not to fly one of these, right? Ultimately, the order you choose to train these in is kind of up to you. Depends on the kind of content you want to achieve with it. But for me, I just literally put them in order of get everything to one, get everything to two, and then I just trained it up that way and didn't undock it until everything was at least at four. Get this to five. Beyond that though, the rest of your skill is going to depend on what you're doing with the Tengu. In the case of this video, I'm going to want scanning skills all the way up so that I can probe down wormholes and all of the different sites within them, and we've got a whole load of missile skills because I am heavily focusing on heavy assault missiles. Hence I've got heavy assault missiles, heavy assault missile specialization, then all of the stuff like missile bombardment, warhead upgrades, rapid launch missile, you know, you know the drill by now. If you're looking to fly a strategic cruiser, you probably have a fairly solid uh, grasp on the skills that you are going to need in order to fly it. But you are going to want to have high ship skills. This is not the kind of vessel that you want to just half ass. You want to full ass this thing. Like genuinely make sure you have all of the shield skills that you want, all of the weapon skills that you want, all of the navigation skills, all of that kind of stuff to be getting the most out of this ship. Next up then, let's talk about the fit itself. First of all, what is the purpose of this fit? I want to be able to go through wormholes, fairly cloaky and nice and safe. I want to be able to find relic and data sites and complete those, and be able to do the combat sites as well. Now I appreciate this is a fairly niche fit. It's my desire to basically push a chain of wormholes and be able to complete all of the content in there, except for ore and gas sites, right? Now, I went across originally to Ashy in Space, which is absolutely one of my favorite EVE Online blogs. If you're not familiar with it and you're interested in wormholes, absolutely check out Ashy's blog. She is fantastic. She has some really cool fits, a load of really interesting discussions on wormholes, and pretty much wrote the guide, or rather literally wrote the guide on how to crab. So I looked at one of her guides for the Tengu and I just changed it up a bit and played around with it until I was happy with what I had available. Now I know for a fact that C3 wormhole ratting sites have a couple of very scary things going on with them. You will find a lot of ships that are neutralizing, which means we need to have something to counter for that because otherwise we're just going to run out of capacitor and die. The Tengu also is surprisingly tanky as a T3C, but at the same token, it also does incredibly well as a signature tank. That means it's hard to hit. As long as you keep moving, you don't take all that much damage and you can survive most of what a C3 ratting site can throw at you. The trouble also is that there are quite a few rats in those anomalies that apply stasis or weather fires to you, which slow you down and increase the amount of damage you take, of course. That is a big problem with the Tengu, so those are kind of what we need to take into consideration in how we go about this fitting. Now, before we do anything else, then we need to look at the subsystems involved on this. Now, first up at the very front here, we have the augmented graviton reactor. This is our core subsystem. It's not the prettiest of them in my opinion, but it is very powerful. For each level in Kaldari, uh, Kaldari core subsystems, we have 5% bonus to capacity capacity and a 3% bonus to energy warfare resistance. So a 15% resistance to the neutralizers that they're gonna be hitting us with and a 25% bigger capacitor to boot. That's really nice. We then have a roll bonus that's actually going to give us another 50 gigajoules of capacity capacity, and this one is going to then give us two mid slots and two low slots. Now, ultimately, we do then have the bonus to the ship power output, also very nice, just so that we can pump some more stuff into this and not worry too much about the power grid. Our second system then, looking at the defensive, I want this to be a cloaky Tengu, so this is an obvious choice for me. It's going to be the Covert Reconfiguration. Now, arguably, you don't need to have a Covert Ops Cloak if you're going through a wormhole in something like a Tengu. You're not going to be using it in combat, it's just on the off chance that you hit a gate camp or something on the way in. And arguably, if you're in something like a T3C, you might find that that gate camp is actually pretty handleable for you. And you can just fly out of it, or maybe even turn around and smack the gankers back. I have seen plenty of kill mails where someone in a Tengu got gate camped by a saber that then promptly regretted it. Anyway, for me though, I want that cloak. So this is obvious because this is going to give me the ability to fit the cloaking devices and a reduction to their CPU. It does also come with the bonuses to core and combat scanner probe strength and relic and data analyzer virus strength, which is always really nice too. 
We then have bonuses to shield booster effectiveness and to the benefits of overheating shield boosters. Not that I've ever needed to use this one, but that 7.5% bonus per level of defensive systems is really nice and gives us some surprisingly effective shields going on here. The actual thing itself though, an additional high slot to allow us to fit that cloak, three mid slots to go for additional tank here, and some nice stat boosts on the bottom there. Moving on then to the offensive subsystems, again there's not much to say about this one, it's missiles. You can choose with the Tengu whether you want it to go with medium missile weapons, whether you want it to go with medium hybrids, or whether you want it to fit for logistics. I want it for missiles, so this is the obvious choice of the subsystem here. It's all bonus damage to missiles, it's making sure that you've got launcher hard points, um, seven high slots, six launcher hard points. Remember we've got one from previously as well, which is for our cloak. This seventh high slot here um, is going to be our probe launcher, which we'll see in a moment. And otherwise, pretty decent layout, but it's all about just damage to the missiles. The only alternatives are either medium hybrids or logistics. I didn't want either of those, so it's obviously going to be that subsystem. Finally then, we have the propulsion subsystem. In this case, I've gone for the fuel catalyst. Again, here you do kind of have a choice whether you go for the wake limiter or the fuel catalyst. The fuel catalyst gives us two mid slots, which to me is more important than the low slot that you'd get from the uh, fr from the wake limiter. The wake limiter is one mid slot and one low slot, if I remember correctly. The two mid slots is more important than getting a bit of extra damage from the low slots. But ultimately beyond that as well, it, that is up to you. That's one you can change around if you want to mix the fit and do something a little bit different with it. For example, if you didn't have the Zoigma Analyzer, then going for the Wake Limiter, you'd be fine because you can run this ship just without that on it and get an additional, mid sl an additional low slot for more damage, for example. It's also got a bonus to afterburner velocity bonus. Because I said we're going to be signature tanking, we need to be moving at all times. We want to be speed tanking, ergo afterburner, not micro warp drive. And this is a straight up bonus to afterburners. You do get a bonus for overheating micro warp drives, but we don't care. We are worried mostly about the afterburner and a 50% bonus to afterburner velocity bonus is pretty sweet. Makes us surprisingly nippy and ridiculously hard to hit. The wake limiter is all about just flat propulsion bonuses and agility and stuff like that. Again, you might find that that fits your needs better. For me though, I go with the fuel catalyst. But what are we putting in those modules? Well, for the high slots, I've already mentioned it's going to be heavy assault missile launchers. You can see here I've gone for heavy assault missile launcher 2s. I've currently got Inferno Rage heavy assault missiles in them. I will also carry a whole load of Inferno Javelin heavy assault missiles there as well. It doesn't matter whether they're Inferno Scourge, jo uh, Inferno Scourge Nova or Mjolnir. The damage time doesn't matter because sleepers have unique omni resistance across the board. They are resistant equally to everything. So just grab a load of rage and javelin missiles of whatever type happens to be cheapest and off you go. The rage do slightly more damage and are shorter range with better application. The javelins are longer range with lower damage and slightly worse application. Basically you're going to use the javelins for anything that wants to stay out of your range and the rage on anything that you can actually stick to and stay within range of. You can see that the rage here have a range of 23 kilometers, the javelins start off around about 43 kilometers with the skills that I have available. Now we will talk more about those range in just a moment. The other two slots of course a covert ops cloaking device and a probe launcher, expanded probe launcher in this case because I want to be able to launch both uh, combat probes and uh, standard scanner probes as well. I want to be able to use core and combat here so I need an expanded probe launcher. I do actually have a sisters probe launcher expanded sitting around that I would normally put in here. I just didn't have it available at the time that I put this fit together and I wasn't prepared to buy another sisters expanded because those things are expensive on the market. And if I've got one laying around, there's no point. For the mid slots, talking about range, we have a missile guidance computer. This can be fit with either missile range scripts or missile precision scripts. The precision scripts improve your application, which means you're going to do more damage to smaller and faster targets. Very useful if you're going up against frigates and you just want to make sure you're doing as much damage to those as possible. Otherwise, you turn it off briefly, you swap out the, range, uh, the precision script, you put in a range script, and when you activate it, suddenly your missiles become a little bit further. I don't know if it actually shows that in the simulator. Let's turn everything on. We should see there that, yeah, the flight range now on the heavy assault missiles and the rage missiles has gone from 23 kilometers up to 29 kilometers and the javelins now shoot out to 52, I believe it is at that point. 
Below this though, we have our tank, a large shield booster 2, a multi-spectrum shield hardener 2, and an EM shield hardener 2. Now, Ashi's original fit did also have an enduring shield hardener in here as well. I haven't really needed it yet. I swapped those out for the Zoigma integrated analyzer, which allows me to do the relic and data sites, but obviously, if you don't care about doing relic and data sites, you can swap this out for another hardener to really push those resists up. You'll notice we have no shield electromagnetic damage resistance, and some of the sleepers do heavy electromagnetic damage. So again, when we simulate with everything on, you'll see that this shoots all the way up to 63%. With the in, uh, enduring multi-spectrum shield hardened that was part of her fit, my skills took that up to 67%. I was happy to drop the 4% in order to get that integrated analyzer in. And you know what? For me, it's working. Y you change the fit as you see the need. Because we've got a bit of active tank going on here, we need to make sure we are as cap uh, capacitor stable as possible. Republic Fleet Large Cap Battery helps us to achieve that. You can see we are stable, standard here. With everything running, we are standard. That said, we're not going to have the integrated analyzer running most of the time, and we can cycle the shield booster as we need. And if the shield booster is not active, you can see we're a very cap stable. With the shield booster running, we're still cap stable. It's a large shield booster, but we are still cap stable until we're being muted. You can remain cap stable whilst being muted by one newt. With this, if you do get hit by a second newt, you're going to need to turn that large shield booster off temporarily in order to be a, you know, cap stable. Just cycle it when you need it so you're recharging between uses. That is absolutely vital. Because again, we are signature tanking, we need an afterburner. Afterburner 2 here is what I've gone for for the time being. You'll notice a lot of these are standard Tech 2 modules, and yet it's working for me. I've kept the fit fairly cheap. You can then upgrade these. I will probably trade out, for example, the Multi-Spectrum Shield Hardener 2 to a Dread Guristus Shield Hardener to get an extra bit of uh, push up on some of those. Same with the uh, EM Shield Hardener. Might even sit there and play around with this for like a Gisty uh, C type, B type, or A type to get a bit more flight velocity out of it. There's all kinds of stuff you can do to upgrade it if you've got the ISK. The low slots, nice and simple, ballistic control systems. Nothing else we really need there, so let's just get the extra damage. For the rigs, a medium core defense operational solidifier helps us with our shield tanking, a capacitor control circuit 2 keeps us a bit more capacitor stable, and a medium ancillary current router 1 was needed just to make sure that I had enough power grid to fit everything. It's a pretty power grid hungry fit, if you've got better skills than I have you might not need that one, simulate it and see how you do. But anyway folks, that's everything here from the Tengu. When this is up and running, you can see we have nice decent resists across the board here, primarily in thermal, but it's mainly, you know, we're going to be taking damage mainly this side of things as it happens, so we're okay there. Decent enough uh, shield stability. We've got good capacitor stability with the shield booster running, the large shield booster running. We get a lot of shield boosting coming out of that, which is really, really nice. We are fast, we are small, we do a decent whack of damage, 634.5 DPS. Again, you might find ways to improve that. Um, for me, it's more than enough, and it'll clear the site I'm about to show you in about 15 minutes. So here I'm jumping into a Fortification Frontier Stronghold. This is a C3 sleeper ratting site in Wormholes, and I've made sure that I'm checking up on which of the ships in this anomaly are the triggers. If you don't know what triggers are, essentially in the C3, well, in the wormhole ratting sites, when you kill certain ships, it will spawn the next wave. And that can be disastrous if you hit those ships too soon. There's nothing worse than being literally like the first two ships dead into a wave, and then wave two suddenly spawns. You've still got all of wave one and the entirety of wave two, right? So anyway, I'm looking around, I've identified what my triggers are here. I know that this is going to be the Awakened Defenders. I need to ensure that the Awakened Defenders are killed last. And for the first wave, this actually does kind of work in my favour, because the Emergent Defenders are the ones that are likely to cause me problems. I know that the Emergent Defenders are the Frigates, and those are going to Webify me. And remember, if I'm webbed, I'm moving slowly. If I'm moving slowly, I'm going to take more damage. It's also worth noting at this point that I'm a bit of an idiot. I dropped the cloak, I went to activate everything, I activated the multi-spectrum shield hardener 2, I then deactivated it, and by the fact that I haven't reactivated it, that suggests I haven't noticed at this point. I'm watching this footage back and commentating it by the way, but essentially 
I haven't activated the multi-spectrum shield hardener too, which means I'm actually running remarkably low level resists at the moment, but because I'm signature tanking okay, I'm taking very little damage. So we've taken down the first emergent defender and it's at this point that I sit there and I go, right, okay, let's change to the Inferno Rage. I then realize I've got very few Inferno Rage with me and I've actually loaded all of them into one go. So I've had to put Nova Rage missiles in the other side. Remember the rats here are completely Omni resist. Doesn't matter if I'm hitting them with Inferno or Nova. And also the fact that I've got so many different types of missiles in my cargo hold also makes it incredibly confusing for me to try and find the ones that I actually want. Bring one type, you only need one type. At a pinch, bring two, just in case you're jumped by someone who you do actually want to fight and you think that you've got like you know for example if you go up against uh, something that's got heavy explosive resistances and you've been using Nova well at least you can swap to your Mjolnirs that you've got instead that kind of thing but for the most part you'll see those rage are doing quite nicely there against that emergence defender I'm gonna keep hitting D scan every now and then I'm gonna bring my probes back in as well just so that there's less stuff on D scan next time I tap it and also so that no one else is gonna kind of spot my probes and then go oh there's someone here and consider trying to scan me down I'm gonna try and be as quiet and covert about this as possible we're now coming towards the end of wave one. Again, I made sure to keep this awakened defender alive right to the end, because killing this one, you'll see, is the trigger to spawn wave two. It's not when everything dies, it's when specific enemies die, so you need to identify which enemies are gonna die first. For this wave, for example, I know it's the Awakened Upholders, and that's a bit of a problem for me, because those are also the most dangerous ships in this wave for me. The Awakened Defenders are just cruisers, but the Awakened Upholders, as you can now see at the bottom of my screen, are both neutralizing and webbing me. That's a problem, because they are going to be hurting my capacitor, and they're slowing me down so that I take more damage. So I'm going to change my setup around a little bit. I want to get rid of one of those upholders quickly. And first of all, that's going to be my absolute priority. But I cannot kill the second one yet. That is where the problem lies, because killing that second one will spawn rain, uh, wave three. And I don't want to have to fight all of wave two and wave three at the same time. That way lies ship destruction. So we're going to change across to some javelins now because approaching this upholder whilst I'm webbed and moving at 117 meters per second is a bad idea. Ultimately, I can't get close enough for the rage to work properly, so I'm going to change across to javelins and start hitting with that. Again, Omni resists. Those aren't going to do all that much damage per hit, but they don't need to. I've got four ships in the first wave, four ships in the second wave, and I think five or six in the third wave, which means this is still a fairly quick site to clear. And it's about 42 million isk worth of gear that you, uh, of loot you get from this blue loot that you sell to NPC stations. 42 million isk worth of blue loot for about 15 minutes worth of content. So multiply that out by the four, and you're looking at about 160 million an hour more than nearly 170 million an hour by running these sites nice and easy there we are there's the first upholder dead we are not going to go for the second upholder because that will spawn wave three i'm going to start taking those defenders out and you'll see that essentially at this point i'm just cycling that shield booster when i need it i put it on for a few cycles get my shields back up and then i'll eventually turn it off and then just let my capacitor recharge a bit. At this point, the neutralization isn't bad. I'm actually still cap stable, even with the large shield booster running, but I don't want to risk it. I'd rather try and keep my capacitor up. It's a you know nice bit of practice there just to keep it going. It's worth pointing out at this point, I have just figured out that I left the multi-spectrum shield hardener off and I've seen fit to correct that. So we are now with the multi-spectrum shield hardener two on as well. If you're paying attention to the chat at all, you may have noticed that I've just realized at this point in the conflict that I have forgotten my MTU. Mobile tractor units are pretty useful for wormhole ratting because sleepers don't drop bounties. You get all of the isk from what's called blue loot, special items that they drop from their wreckage that sells for a set value at NPC stations. That now means I'm going to have to manually fly around at the end of this mission and pick that all up wreck by wreck. But here we are now in wave three, the third and final wave of this fortification frontier stronghold. 
This is pretty straightforward for me. I have a nice big battleship sitting at the middle of this that I'm probably going to want to kill fairly quickly. But again, I have awakened upholders here. Upholders I know are going to be newting me and they're going to be webbing me. So I want to kill them quickly. And you can see I'm taking a fair whack of damage at the moment because I am double webbed and double newted. That's from the Awakened Upholder and from the Sleepless Upholder. Those both need killing nice and quickly. The Awakened Preserver in this case is going to be remote repping the other ships in the Anomaly as well. So that is one you want to take out quickly, but I really needed to get that in Upholder down fast so that I could get rid of that web because I'm just taking too much damage otherwise. That is absolutely vital. Um, you can try and range things at that point, move right the hell away from where the spawn would be and let everything come out to you one at a time. But ultimately, again, if you're right in the thick of it, the Tengu can hold up with that. I've taken a good amount of damage, but the shield booster is quite happy to repair it. And even whilst being muted, my capacitor is not heavily struggling. So I can w just get on with killing off that preserver. Don't have to worry about it then boosting up everything else. I'll probably go for the battleship next, but it does kind of depend what's nearby. Because the battleship is still muting me. It's not a huge problem right now. As I said, my capacitor is stable enough to handle that. But ideally, I would like to get the battleship done so that I don't have to worry about it. So yeah, you know what, let's do that. Swap to the Rage Missiles and pick our target. We are now down to the final ship in this entire anomaly, the Awakened Defender. We're just going to kill this off nice and quickly, and then I'm going to proceed to loot everything afterwards. You can see I've just left the shield booster running at this point because I've got no newt on me or anything. My capacitor is actually recovering beneath me doing that. I'm just hitting this thing with rage missiles and, you know, doing my thing. Ultimately, 42 million isk worth of loot out of this encounter. If I'd put an MTU down, then all of that would pretty much be waiting at the MTU now. I could just fly over to it, pick that up. If it's too far away, warp out of the site and walk back to the MTU bookmark that you definitely made when you dropped the MTU because you're a smart player. But for me, I'm now gonna have to manually fly around each an individual wreck in order to pick up the blue loot which I sell at market. But 42 million isk for about 15 minutes worth of combat anomaly. Not hard math to understand that this is a very lucrative way of getting yourself some isk in a pretty safe and actually surprisingly fun environment. You do take some damage, so it's not completely safe. You do have to be somewhat awake. You'll be wanting to descan just to make sure that there's nothing else trying to jump you and take, you know, an opportune moment to grab you in the middle of a combat anomaly. But ultimately, what a way to make some money. And if I manage to cl uh, clear all of the different combat anomalies in this hole, the next thing I can do is start scanning down some of those other cosmic signatures, checking for relic and data sites. I can scan those down and get a load of loot out of those as well, because you can get some pretty good finds out of central data sites or the uh, ruined relic sites. Some pretty good loot there if you're lucky enough. And that just all increases the amount of isk you're making on a day of playing EVE Online. Anyway, folks, that's the Tengu. I adore this ship. I think it's a lot of fun. I found a fit that allows me to do two completely separate activities all at the same time. So I can just push a chain of wormholes, do all the combat sites, do all the relic sites, do all the data sites. I still bookmark the gas sites because then I come back in my prospect later. And on a good day of wormholing in a few hours in one wormhole, Say I do three or four of these sites, that's about 160 million isk from the loot there, a couple of data sites and relic sites, and I can get even more from that, and a couple of gas sites at 100 million isk a pop each as well. You can be coming out with half a billion isk a day from one wormhole system, all with two ships. Most of that's with one ship. Just if you want the gas sites, you need a prospect. Anyway, folks, that's it for this video. If you did enjoy this, I would really appreciate you hitting a like on it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already for all kinds of EVE Online content. And if you want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, you can do so either via donations on PayPal. I have a uh, Patreon you can pledge to support at and a Redbubble merchandise store as well. If you fancy getting yourself some Catskull Academy loot, for example, like on a t-shirt or a mug or whatever, it's printed 
globally. It's really high quality stuff and I, yeah, I originally set it up just as a bit of fun for me to print my own t-shirts, but then other people started enjoying it as well. So heck, if you're one of those people who might enjoy a t-shirt, go check it out. Otherwise, folks, thank you for watching right the way through to the end on this one. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.